president of Teachers College. Well, thank you. So good afternoon and welcome. We're honored to host the 32nd United States Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, at Teachers College today. Nutrition security is a priority for the Biden administration. And all of us look forward to hearing Secretary Vilsack's report on actions the administration is taking to advance nutrition security so that all Americans have a consistent access to safe, healthy, affordable, and ecologically sustainable food. Addressing nutrition insecurity is a challenge that is foundational to our mission at Teachers College. Indeed, the roots of Teachers College lie in what could, one could call a 19th century nutrition security effort. Grace Dodge, TC's founder and a notable 19th century philanthropist, established a kitchen garden school in Greenwich Village in 1880 to instruct poor immigrant women in the domestic arts, including the cultivation and preparation of nourishing food. As that effort took off, she recognized the need for a new kind of teaching to address the unique needs of the immigrant community. She founded Teachers College to meet that need. From its earliest days, TC embraced a comprehensive approach to human development that encompassed psychological well-being and physical and nutritional health, as well as schooling. In 1909, 22 years after our founding, TC Professor of Nutrition Mary Schwartz Rose established the nation's first college-based nutrition program here. 104 years later, in 2013, an esteemed TC trustee provided a generous gift to establish and support the Lori M. Tisch Center for, for Food, Education, and Policy, named after her and dedicated to working at the intersection of education and food and nutrition research, policy, and practice. We're delighted to host Secretary Vilsack to speak on an issue that is so central to what we do here at TC. We look forward to partnering with him and the Biden administration to advance food justice and ameliorate our country's inequitable food system. Now, I'm pleased to introduce TC's Provost, Dean, and Vice President for Academic Affairs, Stephanie Rowley. routine with the mask there. Thank you, President Bailey, and welcome, Secretary Vilsack. And also a warm welcome to all of our guests who are able to be here in person and those who are with us today online. We're incredibly honored to have Secretary Vilsack here at Teachers College. The Secretary has an extraordinary record of public service. Prior to his current term at USDA, he was Secretary of Agriculture for the Obama administration from 2009 to 2017. And before that, a two-term governor of Iowa, an Iowa state senator, and the mayor of Mount Pleasant, Iowa. Before we hear from uh, Secretary Vilsack, I want to highlight some of the strides he made while uh, in his post at the USDA, where he's made nutrition security a top priority. Among other successful efforts, the secretary revamped school nutrition guides for healthier school meals. He recently increased SNAP benefits and participation in the program and ensured SNAP recipients had access to nutritional food through new partnerships with farmers markets. He's also provided almost $500 million from the American Rescue Plan to incentivize the, purchase of, the purchase of fruits, fruits and vegetables under the Women, Infants, and Children Food Program. It's quite a track record, and we can't wait to hear, hear more. Nutrition security is an issue that TC's Lori M. Tisch Center for Food Education and Policy has been working on since its founding. The Tisch Food Center is at the forefront of research in school food, child nutrition, and food access policies. Through its Food Ed Hub, it runs a coalition of food education partners across the city to advocate for and implement food and nutrition education, 
as well as policies to support healthy, appealing school meals. Ultimately, the Tisch Food Center, in, the, in concert with the Food Ed Coalition, plays a frontline role in maximizing the dollars from the USDA uh, going towards spending on food and nutrition programs. As we all know, the devastating impacts of food inequity became more stark during COVID. We saw a dramatic increase in food insecurity and individuals suffering from diet-related illnesses are at significantly higher risk for severe disease and death. The Tisch Food Center accelerated its work during this crisis. It advocated to increase food benefit programs and access to emergency food and developed guidance and tools for digital food education. <clears throat> We have today with us in the audience the center's current executive director, Sarah Abiola, who is also an associate research professor in health and behavior studies. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome. And Dr. Pam Koch, the Tisch Food Center's founding executive director is also here. Dr. Koch is the co-director of TC's Center for Sustainable Futures and the Mary Swartz Rose Associate Professor of Nutrition Education. She'll be joining Secretary Vilsack after his remarks for a conversation about challenges and opportunities in the arena of food nutrition security. Thanks so much, and now help me welcome Secretary Vilsack. I'd like to thank the, well, you've got a lot of titles. Dean Riley, thank you very much for uh, that introduction, and uh, President Bailey, thank you very much for the history lesson, uh, which in just a few minutes you'll realize how significant it was uh, in terms of my remarks. And I want to also acknowledge uh, Commissioner Ball, uh, who is with us today, uh, who has been a great leader in agriculture in the state of New York and around the country, uh, and a good friend. So I appreciate him being here today. And I want to thank everybody uh, for spending a few minutes with us uh, this afternoon. I think this is a, a uh, in, an historic day for the Department of Agriculture and an important day. And I think it is fitting for us to be here at Teachers College uh, on, uh, on the uh, campus of Columbia University to ba basically talk about nutrition security. Uh, how many of you folks know who Mabel McFiggin is? Oh, wow. How good is that? There are actually three or four people in this audience who know that. Well, Mabel's a really important person. Uh, when it comes to uh, issues involving food. Uh, she lived in Rochester, New York, uh, and in May 16th of 1939, in the midst of the Depression, Mabel was the first purchaser of food stamps. Uh, she went in and she purchased with, uh, uh, with her resources a, bank, a book of, of orange stamps uh, for a dollar a stamp, which allowed her to go into any grocery store and purchase any item in the grocery store with those stamps. When she purchased those orange stamps, she also got, for 50 cents, blue stamps. I, I mean, no, she didn't have to pay for the blue stamps. She got a, a, a book of blue stamps uh, worth 50 cents a stamp. And those stamps were allowed to be redeemed at grocery stores for what was then surplus product, uh, so determined by the Department of Agriculture. So she was the first recipient who began the process of a formal program at USDA uh, to provide assistance with a focus on food security and with a focus on helping the farmers out during a tough time. The Children's Aid Society of New York, how many people know what that is? Everybody knows what that is, that's good. Well, in 1853, uh, a group of mothers who were associated with that society decided it was a good idea for them to volunteer their services in establishing what was then uh, the first effort at any kind of uh, organized school meal program. Uh, they decided that they would come together, they would plan, create, and serve meals uh, to the children in need. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, a survey was done about poverty in America, which highlighted uh, the, the important role of nutrition and poverty specifically as it related to potential school performance by students. Uh, it was written, uh, the book was written by Robert Hunter, and that began the process of spreading the idea of school meals. But it wasn't until 1946, President Truman uh, was concerned about the fact that in America we didn't have people strong enough getting enough caloric intake 
to create a number of people that would be able to defend the country if we, in fact, we found ourselves at war again. And so he and members of Congress worked together uh, to pass uh, the National School Lunch Act of 1946, which was for the first time the consolidation of all of these lunch programs, a single program, national uh, impact. In 1967, a group of scientists and researchers worked together to produce the National uh, Nutrition Survey. Uh, and in 1967, they identified within the US that there were serious dietary and health trends among low-income Americans, particularly among those uh, uh, young children uh, and pregnant women. And so as a result of that, over the next five years, people like Hubert Humphrey, uh, George McGovern, Bob Dole, uh, they worked uh, to ultimately create the Women and Infant Children uh, program that we now ser serves uh, pregnant women and children under the age of six with a, a variety of fruits and vegetables that they might not otherwise have access to. As you look at the history of our food programs in the United States, there are several takeaways that I think are important to the discussion today. First of all, as was the case with food stamps and uh, to a certain extent school meals, there was a crisis or a, a, a challenge that the nation faced. And there were leaders who believed it was appropriate to take something from that challenge and create an effort to improve access to food. In essence, uh, the crisis management led to change, uh, and change required the leadership to think differently and to think anew. If you look at the school meal program and, and the genesis of the WIC program, what you find is the power of ordinary folks beginning the conversation, uh, providing the information and the data that would allow leaders to understand the importance of taking action. Uh, the power uh, that individuals have to move government uh, into action. And I think throughout all of that, you see the significant role that partnerships, relationships between government and universities, government, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, uh, citizens uh, plays in terms of making a difference. So we as a nation over the last several years have faced a, a, a crisis of national magnitude global magnitude, uh, there was significant disruption in our individual lives, and there was obviously significant disruption to both the health and well-being of people in this country and around the world, and to our economy and to the global economy. Tens of millions were sick, millions were unemployed, and tragically soon we will uh, mark the millionth death connected to COVID. It caused a major disruption in the food and agriculture industry and business. You know, I lump those together because sometimes there's a tendency to separate them. We put the farms over here and the rest of the food world over here. When we do that, I think we diminish the impact and effect of both. When you combine them, uh, what you learn is it is a rather significant aspect of American life. Uh, the employment, depending upon what study you look at, is anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of the entire uh, uh, employed uh, base of the U.S. Millions of people uh, are, are in this business and are dependent on this business for their livelihoods. When you look at the economic impact uh, on the overall economy, what you could find are studies that show that it impacts as much as 20 percent of the GDP of this country. So it's important and significant, I think, to understand that when there's a major disruption in agriculture and food systems, it's, it's significant. And we know that what happened, restaurants shuttered, people lost their jobs, schools closed down, uh, and rendered uh, significant challenges in terms of the school meal programs. And many of us faced grocery stores where the shelves were bare for some time. What was amazing during that pandemic, the early stages of the pandemic, and even today, is the remarkable commitment of ordinary folks to make a difference. Now, I've been to a number of food banks recently, and I can tell you that that is one place in America that we should celebrate every single day. 
for the amazing work that's being done by those who run and operate food banks and most importantly by those who volunteer in those food banks. It is absolutely remarkable the kind of help and assistance that they're providing and the quality and the level of nutrition that they are anxious to provide. The extraordinary extent of services that are provided by our food banks. They really focused on the need and they responded quickly. And because of that, and as a result of that, and inspired by that, I think government also responded. We increased SNAP benefits. We looked at the Thrifty Food Plan, and we asked the question, was it calculated based on the America of today, or was it based on the America of long ago? Well, it turns out that we hadn't done this for 45 years. So the chances were pretty good we were going to find out a different result relative to the level of benefit, and indeed we did. And so for the first time in 45 years, we provided an improvement, an increase in the SNAP benefit above and beyond inflation, reflecting what is happening in American households today, the activity levels, the caloric intake, the cost of food, and the wide array of food available in grocery stores. We also increased the minimum benefit during the course of this pandemic. We, we took a look at ways in which we could provide at least the minimum for those who qualified for SNAP. We extended waivers to our schools uh, so that they could do grab and uh, uh, go meals, that they didn't require everyone to show up at the school at the same time for a meal. An extraordinary uh, transition that was done by our schools. We increased WIC benefits with a bonus payment and we created uh, a number of programs which encouraged the delivery of fresh fruits and vegetables and other food products uh, to folks around the country. And we learned a lot of, uh, from that experience about the importance of that effort, but how to improve uh, the, 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 the integrity of that effort. We also looked at the impact of innovation and the significance of us thinking anew we looked at our summer feeding program and recognized that even with waivers, there was gonna be challenges for families who were on free and reduced lunch who were hunkered down because of COVID, being able to provide the nutrition necessary for their kids to do well and to be fed well. And so we created the summer EBT program, additional resources to families. And it made a difference. It put a little extra cash in the pockets of those moms and dads. They know, and certainly school officials know, and you all know, that when you make sure that youngsters are fed throughout the year, not just in 181 days at school, that in fact, educational performance improves. That you can't feed them during school and let the summer ends languish and then expect these kids to pick up right where they left off in terms of learning. So we innovated and we created this summer EBT program. And we'll continue to look for ways in which we can expand uh, the extent and the operation of that program. Uh, we're going to take care of this summer and we're going to try to work with our friends in Congress to ensure that this is a program that continues. We looked at these food boxes and we said, are there ways in which we can incorporate them more succinctly and more effectively in our emergency feeding programs? And so we created the flexible uh, TFAP program. Uh, which is our uh, temporary assistance uh, food program. And what we wanted to do was to work with Commissioner Ball and others in states across the country and provide them the resources to be able to say, here are resources, figure out a way to take these resources and rather than purchasing from national distributors and doing it sort of the easy way, let's figure out how to create that infrastructure locally and regionally to be able to have those food banks actually access product from where it was grown and raised right down the street, right down the road. And this is part of an overall strategy to begin changing the economy because it isn't just enough to increase benefits, it's also necessary, as the president says, for our economy to be approached a little bit differently. Instead of top down, we need to be approaching it bottom up and middle out. To do that, especially in rural communities, we have to create a more circular economy instead of an extraction economy. For far too long in the United States, we've been taking things from the land and off the land and out of the land and under the land. 
and we've transported them someplace else where they were converted into something else more valuable, where opportunity was created someplace else, where jobs were created someplace else, where wealth was created someplace else. And then those same items were sold back to rural Americans at a much higher cost. And because of this circular, because of the lack of a circular economy, because of the extraction economy, what we've seen is we've seen an erosion, a diminishment, a shrinkage of those who live, work, and raise families in those rural communities. We've seen a consolidation of farmland in those communities, which some of us would say is not necessarily in the best long-term interest of the country. A circular economy essentially allows that, that agricultural production, every aspect of it, to be processed, if you will, to be changed, if you will, to be a value added, if you will, locally and regionally, so that the resource, the opportunity, the job, the wealth stays close to where the natural resource advantage was, providing a, a, a more balanced economy, a, a, an economy that literally can grow from the bottom up and the middle out. We're here today, though, not just to talk about a change in philosophy in terms of the economy, but also to take a look at the role of the Department of Agriculture. For f ever, it has been focused on food insecurity, making sure that our job was to, in the nutrition space, was to, was to ensure that people who were struggling financially had access to food. Well, I'm here today to suggest that we have an equally important responsibility. And it's not just simply to focus on food insecurity to make America a more food secure nation. It is also on, incumbent upon the Department of Agriculture to embrace the challenge and the responsibility of creating an America that is also nutritionally secure. Now, what does that mean? What is nutrition security? We, we know what food security means. We know what it means in terms of being able to provide folks with sufficient resources to be able to go to the grocery store and be able to buy what they need to feed their family. But what does it mean to be nutritionally secure? Well, I think it means a, a consistent access, not a once in a while, but a consistent access to food that's obviously healthy, as well as safe and affordable. Food that is designed to provide optimal health benefits and the well-being of those consuming it. It's a big, tall task, but it's one that we need to undertake. Why? Because we learned from this pandemic the linkage between nutrition security and health. It was surprising to me, and maybe it was surprising to some of you, that two-thirds of the COVID-related hospitalizations that occurred and are occurring have been related to obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart failure. These are all diet-related conditions. Two-thirds of all the hospitalizations. Stated another way, poor nutrition is connected to the leading cause of illnesses that take over 600,000 lives every year before the pandemic and today. There's an economic cost to poor nutrition. Just take diabetes, just one, $147 billion. That's roughly equivalent to the entire budget of the Department of Agriculture on just one diet-related disease. And don't take into consideration the loss of productivity, the loss of, of quality of life connected to diet-related diseases. So, COVID was essentially a, a wake-up call, a very specific reminder of what we've known for some time, that there is indeed a connection between our overall health and our diet. And it's important and necessary for us to begin the process of having a conversation, a much broader conversation with the country about this, not in a judgmental way, not in a critical way, but in an informative way, making sure that people understand the linkage. It's taken a long time for people to understand the importance of food security, 
the understanding and challenges of food insecurity and support for the programs that we currently have, high levels of support for these programs. Now we must begin the process of educating and expanding the scope and understanding and support for nutrition security. Now we've taken some initial steps at USDA to sort of integrate all of this into what we do. I mentioned the review of the Thrifty Food Plan. Part of the reason we did this is that we surveyed folks and what we found was that at the end of the month, the people who were receiving supplemental nutrition assistance, the SNAP benefits, at the end of the month they were making tough decisions. They weren't in a position financially to be able to decide whether or not to buy that fruit and vegetable that they knew they wanted to buy but couldn't. So we looked at the Thrifty Food Plan and we increased it. We're looking for ways to improve the WIC package. Constantly looking at ways in which we take the science and make sure that we expand and change and transform that WIC package and expand the knowledge and awareness of WIC so that more who are qualified for the program participate in the program and when they do that they have a wide range uh, within this package that exposes them to fruits and vegetables that they might not otherwise ever know. And getting children early in this process is critically important. I don't have any scientific evidence of this but I sure as heck from my own family have anecdotal evidence. You start early, you got a chance. You start late, Mm, it's tough. We started late with broccoli in my family. We're still not there on my 40-year-old younger son. We'll continue to work on him. I mentioned the flexible uh, TFAP program, and what we're currently doing with that is we're also looking at ways to, to actually have fresh fruit uh, and vegetable boxes being delivered. Uh, tens of millions of dollars have already been allocated for this purpose, and we hope to expand that effort, we put together the Reach and Resiliency Grant Program, which was designed to say to food banks, we get it, you want to do more, you just don't have the financial resources to have the storage and refrigeration capacity that would allow you to do more. So we put $100 million from the American Rescue Plan on the table and said, what would you do with it? We just have two asks. One, what would you do with it in terms of your infrastructure? Would you use it to expand storage, warehousing? refrigeration capacity? Or could you also use it in a way to determine how best to do what was begun during the pandemic in the early stages of reaching to those rural remote areas and those inner city areas that never really got the benefit, full benefit of the food bank? How can we figure out a way? Instead of asking folks to come to the food bank, how do we get the food bank to come to them? So we're in the process of collecting applications on this for the first $15 million. We'll learn from the allocation of those resources. We'll take the second tranche of money. And then from that, we'll learn to how potentially to talk to our friends in Congress about a more permanent structure of providing those kinds of resources in order to promote nutrition security. And in the course of time, we're also going to continue to look at ways in which we can provide resources under our Healthy Food Financing Initiative, which is really designed to address the issue of food deserts which exist again in those inner city areas, but also very much so in rural remote areas. But we needed more than just programs. We needed a commitment. We needed a framework. We needed a set of strategic pillars, if you will, that would allow us from this point forward to apply it to everything we do at USDA within our food and nutrition and consumer service mission areas. Everything we do relative to other mission areas of USDA that might be supportive, whether it's in our research initiative or even in our rural development initiatives, or even within our farm program initiatives. So today, we announced that strategic framework. We announced the pillars uh, that we will use from this point forward as complementing what we do on the food security side. There are four of them. The first is to make sure that we, we provide nutrition support all stages of life, uh, from pregnancy all the way through. And one way that we can do that 
is by taking a look at the partnerships we have with over 36,000 entities that help us spread information under our SNAP program. We call it our SNAP Ed program. We've got 36,000 uh, partners. Uh, they have information that we give them that needs to be shared. We need to do an even better job than we've done, making sure that that information is relevant and making sure that information gets to those families in a way that they can use it to not only address food security, but also nutrition security. We need to make sure that our school meals continue to meet and hopefully in some cases even figure out how to exceed the standards that we've set in terms of nutrition. Recent studies have suggested that this is the best place outside of the home for children to eat, the healthiest place for them to eat. We need to build on that. The second pillar is connecting Americans, all Americans, not just those who are in need of food assistance, but all Americans to healthy, safe, affordable food sources. And again, we look at the schools. Uh, we recently announced, as, uh, as the president mentioned, uh, several hundred million dollars that's going to schools to try to figure out ways in which they can better connect to fruit, vegetable, wholesome, fresh foods being produced in their region and being able to supply that to their youngsters. That's a twofer. Not only do we increase and enhance nutritional opportunities for our kids, but we also help to begin that circular economy discussion. Because to the extent that you buy local, it stays local and it reverberates in the economy multiple times. And it helps those local producers, those small and mid-sized producers stay in business, which I know Commissioner Paul has placed a high priority on. We just can't have large scale ag agriculture in this country. We have to complement it with mid and small sized agriculture in order to have the balance uh, that I think is in the diversity, which I think is incredibly important to the health uh, of agriculture. We're gonna continue to look for ways uh, to, to address the third pillar, which is the scientific language of nutrition. Now, in the halls that we're in today, you all can converse with that technical language and you all can understand it, but the rest of us have a hard time. Be the first to admit, I never got the food pyramid. I really tried. When I got this job the first time, I spent time trying to memorize that thing, what's at the top of the pyramid, what's at the bottom. There were like 85 things in that pyramid. And so we developed the My Plate. Very simple picture. Half your plate, fruits and vegetables, the other half, carbs and protein, a little dairy on the side. I get it, totally get that. Look at my plate every single day. Some days it's right on target. Some days not so much. But I'm cognizant of it, I'm aware of it. And I'm aware that if there are too many of those days that aren't where they need to be, I make adjustments, I make decisions. So we need, to, we need to figure out ways in which we can simplify all of this. Today, uh, NIFA, which is our National Institute of Food and Agriculture, is allocating $5 million to uh, beginning the process of, uh, of developing better and more translatable information about dietary patterns and eating patterns. So we begin to understand more sort of the underlying status of, of nutrition security or insecurity so we can begin the process of trying to figure out how to translate that into meaningful uh, uh, assistance. We, we've got the my plate and we want to do more with it. We want to create more convenient ways for people to have access to information that they can understand. So we've developed a, um, an app, uh, uh, Shop Simple, which gives uh, folks uh, the, the opportunity to learn a little bit about how they may be able to go in the grocery store, stretch one of those, those SNAP uh, resources a little bit more, how they might be able to get access to information that gives them a, a chance to understand recipes and that kind of thing that might be helpful to them. We even have Alexa involved in this. <laughs> now this is a little scary. Um, you, I, I think this is right, Kumar, am I right about this? You got the Alexa, 
And all you got to do is say, Alexa, tell me about my plate or give me a tip from my plate. And Alexa uh, will give you a tip of the day. So we're looking for ways in which we can connect that very technical, hard to understand science with the important decisions that are being made every single day in the home. And finally, I think we have to recognize, certainly at USDA, throughout the entire federal government, all of government, we have to prioritize equity. We have to create a lens of equity. And the beauty of this discussion is the executive order President Biden signed. Uh, it was one of the first, if not the first, executive order he signed. And in it, he defined equity. And he defined it in, broad, in a broad sense. Certainly, Racial, racial and gender and, and ethnic uh, equity we, we get. But he also included rural in there. And, and to me, that's, that was an important message. Uh, we're, this is, we're dealing with folks who feel left out. We're dealing with folks who have been forgotten. We're dealing with folks who don't feel that the, uh, the, the, the world has been fair. We're dealing with folks who, who haven't had access to all of the tools, all of the opportunities. And that's really true of many people, regardless of race, race or ethnicity or gender, who live in rural places. So the ability to prioritize equity gives us a license to really focus our efforts. So we started with uh, uh, an indigenous food uh, effort. We've got uh, pilots with eight tribes to try to better understand the dietary needs of Native American populations and to make sure that as we are doing food programs that we give a, a, an understanding to that. And that's probably gonna lead into a conversation about a lot of other uh, dietary requirements that come that may be different than the general food programs that we, we operate. Excited about the ability to make SNAP and WIC more conveniently available. If you live in one of those rural remote areas or if you live in inner city, you don't have public transportation or it's too expensive or you don't have a car or whatever, the knowledge of going to a grocery store that's a mile away or 10 miles away, pretty tough. Online utilization of benefits, delivery, all of a sudden makes it possible for you to fully participate and to have access. So today marks the day where we begin the process of utilizing these strategic pillars, support for nutrition throughout all stages of life, connecting all Americans to healthy, safe, and affordable food sources, developing and translating and enacting and enabling nutrition science through partnerships to get to ordinary individuals and prioritizing equity. These pillars will now define the decision-making process that we go through, whether it's formulating the dietary guidelines or whether it's figuring out ways in which we can improve SNAP or expand WIC or figure out ways in which we can improve school lunch programs or any other aspect of research that we do. So this is an exciting day uh, and an important day. Let me just finish with a, 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 a private comment why this is important to me, personally. Uh, I started out life in an orphanage and I was adopted into a family early in my life. Uh, I obviously don't know anything about what life was like in the orphanage, except that I know that I was fed well. Now I know that because the picture of me coming into my adopted family is of a very plump guy. My parents used to tell me and I've Initially, I thought they were kidding, but they might have actually been telling me the truth, that my selection among the children who were at the orphanage was something akin, as they explained it, to the selection of the Thanksgiving turkey. Uh, the theory was that if I was plump, I was healthy. That was the mentality back then in 1950, that, that, that health was connected to plumpness. A little different today. I've battled weight issues all my life, all my life. I, I, I've had, I mean, I can't tell you the number of embarrassing experiences in my life that have been connected to weight and diet. Uh, I, I, you know, every diet imaginable, tried it, worked for a day or two, a week, maybe a couple months, maybe a year, 
but it just is a constant struggle. So when I look at children in school, I connect to that youngster who finds himself or herself a bit overweight. And I connect to the circumstance in fourth grade where a math, my math teacher accused me of not being able to do a math problem because I was fat. I understand what that does to your self-esteem. And I don't want that to happen to any kid in America. And I don't think any of us do. So this is serious business. This is not just, you know, public policy and, you know, research and all of that. This is serious business that impacts and affects how people feel and think of themselves and how they relate to the rest of the world and whether they can maximize their God-given talents. So that's why it's important. And I think the Department of Agriculture has an important role to play in all of this. I think it has an important leadership role to play in all of this. And I can tell you that as long as I'm secretary, um, this strategic approach that we announced today is one that we're going to be very focused on. And we're going to look for ways in which we can enhance it. And I fully expect, as was the case with this, with the food stamp program that started in 1939 that's evolved, with the school lunch program that started in the mid-1800s that's evolved, with the RIC program that constantly has evolved, that this too will evolve. Um, and God willing, uh, future secretaries will come back here to report on the progress. Thank you very much. Thank you for such an incredibly moving speech and especially for sharing your personal story at the end. I have a few childhood memories like that as well and they stay with you, so thank you. We also wanna thank you for being here at Teachers College and for making nutrition security a priority and sharing your pillars and your plans with us today. We all know, and especially all of us in the nutrition field here, know that nourishing food every day, which has a foundation in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and other whole foods, as well as a limited amount of processed food products, will really reduce the burden of metabolic diseases on individuals, as well as our healthcare system. When we address nutrition security, we're also making changes in our food supply that make it more ecologically sustainable or climate smart future. Achieving, achieving nutrition security is about also understanding inequities, as you talked about, because that way we'll have a more equitable future, and that way we raise everyone up. My career has been in the field of nutrition education, and we're here at Teachers College, which, as you heard, founded the field of nutrition education over a century ago. And our faculty have continuously worked with the USDA to provide evidence-based nutrition education. One of those is Dr. Isabel Contento, who's here in the audience today. My work has been in schools because they are pillars of change. Food and nutrition education that includes learning about healthy eating, gardening, cooking, exploring food justice, can change the course of students' lives because it can change what they eat today and into the future. And we know that this education works best when it's connected to our school meals program to integrate school meals into the rest of education so it's just part of the school day and that we can encourage students to take and eat those meals. Food and nutrition education is critical. Today's children will become tomorrow's adults who are sadly predicted to have even higher rates of metabolic disease than we have now at the same time that they will face the consequences of climate change, which will alter our food system. So now I'm gonna ask you some questions. Um, and the first question is about nutrition education, because that's near and dear to my heart, as well as many people here in the audience today, um, and many people I'm sure on the live stream as well. So research has shown that nutrition education, particularly when it's focused on specific behaviors, such as making half your plate fruits and vegetables, when it enhances motivation, which is building the intrinsic desire, um, builds really practical knowledge and skills, and creates a supportive environment through what we call policy system and environmental change, or PSEs. It's, that's when it can be effective. So I would love to hear more about 
what USDA is doing in nutrition education and promotion now and what you really hope to expand in the future? We spend uh, roughly a billion dollars uh, in nutrition education, about half of it uh, is in uh, the form of SNAP education, the SNAP education program. I mentioned briefly the 36,000, 37,000 partners we have, and the PSEs are really important, and thousands of changes have occurred as a result of, of the SNAP education. To me, we want to continually look at how we can improve the resources and the, and the output, if you will, and the results from SNAP education. I mean, I think it's important uh, that we not only do the policy change, but we but we reflect the result of that policy change, that it actually results in change behavior, it, it results in improved behavior, it results in, in improved health outcomes. So I'm challenging our team to challenge our partners to look for ways in which these resources can be used in the most effective way, how they can be leveraged. I mean, there are foundations and there are a multitude of folks who are very interested in this space. I think we need to be very creative about the partnerships and the leveraging of SNAP-Ed. Uh, and I think we also need to make sure that we are using the, 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 the most recent science, because this is, again, that opportunity to take very complicated technical stuff and, and figure out how to simplify it to the point where I can understand it, and then be able to convey it to families and make sure that we guide them in the utilization of this information. You know, I think we have a responsibility, and this is hard, but I think we have a responsibility of more than just simply saying, here's a benefit, uh, or even here's a benefit and here's how you might think about, I think, I think it's hard for people. It's, it, it's incredibly difficult, for, especially for families who are struggling financially. They may have two jobs, they may have three jobs, they may, have, may not have a job. And all of that creates incredible stress and, and time constraints. And they may not have the ability just to go to the grocery store and spend a lot of time shopping. They, they may have children at home who are, are fending for themselves because they can't afford uh, child care. So there, there are multiple challenges for those families. But there's even challenges for middle income and even wealthy families in terms of knowing what to do. So I think we need to figure out ways in which we, we, we use technology, we use apps, we use uh, all of the, of the technology that's available that young people are currently accessing and figure out a way in which uh, it, it enhances and, and mag magnifies our message. My, uh, my grandkids do Minecraft, and I was excited to see that Minecraft incorporated, for example, a farm into mm -hmm. Minecraft so that kids could understand, Mr. Ball, how difficult farming really is. It's not a simple, it's not a simple business. So to the extent that you can incorporate those kinds of things, to the extent that you can incorporate it in, in popular culture, uh, again, it reinforcing the message. Mm -hmm. So I think there are multiple ways to, to improve SNAP education. You know, one of the things that you talked about both in your speech and just now is having 36 to 37,000 partners around the country. And I actually know a lot about the, the SNAP education program. And I think that that's one of the real benefits of it because then it's people from your community, possibly people with the same background that look like you that are providing that education. So I think the complement to using the technology in the education is also to make it really, even though it's a national program, to make it really community-based and really fit the culture of where people are at. Well, and also working uh, with our land-grant universities and Extension, that's another uh, important partner. The SNFA grant that I mentioned earlier, they're going to be working with Extension. They're, they're also, a, you know, Boys and Girls Clubs. I mean, there's 4-H. I mean, there's a whole series of, of, of youth programs and, and sports. I mean, kids want to be basketball players. They want to be hockey players, football, whatever. You get eat proper nutrition, and all of these folks who, who we watch every day, uh, uh, you know, they, they are really into nutrition. So we need to figure out how to get them even more engaged than they have been. Yeah. One of the things that you also mentioned is, is that your first pillar, which is, is nutrition support throughout the lifespan. And I think that nutrition education at all of those aspects, one of the key features of the Women, Infants, and Children program is the nutrition education along with the food and thinking about that throughout the lifespan as well. So how do you see connecting nutrition education throughout all the programs through the lifespan? Well, uh, let me just say first and foremost, we have to make sure more people participate in WIC. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is a, just an, un, un, an incredible statistic. 50% of the people who are eligible for WIC do not engage themselves or are involved in WIC. So I think we have to figure out ways in which, A, 
we use the systems and institutions that these folks find themselves intersecting with. It may be a food bank, it may be, uh, you know, it may be a, a, a school, it may be a church, maybe. Where, where do they intersect and with institutions and how can we have those institutions provide the access to the information about the program, about the education, about how to use the program more efficiently, how to use the benefits, where you can use your SNAP benefits at a farmer's market, all of that. How you uh, potentially might have a, a, a private foundation in your community that's providing double bucks where you can expand the access of your SNAP uh, card if you, if you use, uh, purchase certain fruits and vegetables. We need to get that information into the, into the culture, into the bloodstream of the culture so that it's readily available and it's repeated. You know, the other thing, I'd like to, I'd like to think that we tell people something once and it penetrates, but that's not the case. Uh, politicians know this very, very well. Here's the secret about politicians. They have a, a, a stump speech. And it may change at the beginning or at the end based on the people they're talking to, but it's pretty much the same. And the key to the stump speech is that you say it so often that by the end of a campaign, you are almost physically sick having to go out and give that speech again. <laughs> That's kind of what we have to do with this information. Yeah. We have to get it to the point where we go, really, this is the 15th time I've had to tell these people. No, actually, it takes that much time to penetrate everything else that's going on. We have to understand, it's one is not one and done. It's not that case. It's multiple repetition from a variety of sources that reinforce that, hey, I ought to pay, pay attention to this. I need to incorporate that. Eventually, it, it gets into that bloodstream, and eventually it gets into to, to, uh, ways in which people can be, can be changed and transformed. Yeah, no, I, com I completely agree. I'm kind of laughing because uh, some of my students that are in the audience know one of the activities that we do is an activity that shows what can happen that can cause type 2 diabetes, how, how basically metabolically you're going to end up with too much sugar or glucose in your blood. And I've done that activity probably 300 times in my life, but every time I know that the people in the audience, it's, it, it ends up being a aha moment that says, you know what? I'm gonna think about what I'm eating. I'm going to think about what I'm doing. And, and my father had type two diabetes and suffered tremendously. So kind of like your stories, it, it, you know, I saw firsthand what it, what it can do. Yeah. I wanna move on to another question that, um, first I wanna commend that one of your pillars is about equity. And I think that equity is really, really important. Um, one of the reasons why I think it is important is to strive for equity means that we are acknowledging that there was inequi inequities in the past that we need to really be thinking about. So I'd like for you to talk about nutrition security and how that will promote equity and how that's reflective actually across everything that USDA does. Well, we, we have a, a history when it comes to equity um, at USDA. Uh, not a history we were particularly proud of, uh, and a history that we are in the process of trying to, if you will, write a new chapter on. Uh, we have an equity commission we just formed that are gonna take a look at our programs, including our nutrition programs, and figure out are there ways in which we can do a better job uh, of making sure that they're available and accessible. I, you know, the first thing we've learned uh, is trust. Uh, if, you're, if you're really gonna address equity, you cannot come, if you can't be the folks, folks who've been distrustful mm -hmm. and come into a population and say, hey, I've changed, I'm really different, trust me, uh, here, I'm gonna help you. Mm, that's not how it works. You need to go to a trusted community organization or entity or individual and say, help me understand how I can be most useful. H how, I can, how I can listen and learn and from that, partner with you to allow me to begin to build the bridge, to begin to show that I'm really serious about this, and to begin to make sure that the programs that I run or operate are indeed, in fact, accessible, and that we guide people through the program. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to have a program, it's another thing to tell people about it, but then when they have to, by themselves, qualify for the program, it can be, incredibly difficult, um, you know, especially if you're trying to do something online. I can tell you, 
I can't tell you how many times I have ordered something online only to find out that I had ordered six or seven, <laughs> ten of them. I mean, it, it's, it's hard for some people. For young people, it's easy. It's, it, they, 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 but for young, older folks, it's a little bit difficult. So we need to have guides. We need to have people that can help people get, and during the pandemic, it was tough because we didn't have that connection. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we've learned recently at USDA and we're spending resources is to try to create community building organizations and connections between us, those community building organizations, and the community so that we have a trusted voice there saying, here are the programs, and then say, we're here to help you, guide you through the programs. And then once you learn how to do it, and do it several times, then you know how to do it, you know how to play the game. Uh, and and, and so, so that's number one. Number two is making it easier. Uh, you know, one of the areas in SNAP that has always troubled me is senior citizens. Um, and, you know, they just, they look at SNAP and they think it's welfare. No, it's not welfare. It's actually a benefit that benefits all of us because if you're healthier, it means you're not going to the hospital. If you're not going to the hospital, you're not incurring health expense. And that impacts and affects a whole series of things in the economy. So it's important for us to break down that barrier and explain to folks it's in your best interest and frankly my best interest for you to get that benefit so you have access to healthy food. And then once you have access, being able to make sure that that food is available, if you are homebound, how do we help you? Mm -hmm with online activities. So 47 states have online SNAP. We need to get to 50. Um, and we need to figure out ways in which we can make it more convenient. Yeah. One of the things I love that I just want to highlight a few points is acknowledging the distrust is a way to, to build that trust. And I, Lincoln called the USDA the people's department. And that's exactly what all the SNAP Ed partners, as well as these community-based partners for all of your programs are, is making it a very community-based, community by community across the country program instead of something that seems like it's very far away. Go ahead. I think you also have to understand that there's been a price that's been paid uh, for inequity. Yeah. You know, essentially in the farming business, for example, if you're a, a black farmer and a white farmer and you're next to each other and the white farmer was able to get a loan and the black farmer wasn't or the white farmer got a loan sooner or at an interest rate that was different, that made it more difficult for that black farmer to have a crop or to have a crop that was as bountiful to be able to get the right price or have lower input costs, all of which over a period of time put that farmer in a less competitive circumstance in terms of land availability and things of that sort. So over time, gaps created. And this is the top down versus the bottom up, middle out yep. concept. And so equity really is about understanding that and looking for ways in which you help bottom up and middle out. And so the Equity Commission, we're hopeful, will give us a roadmap and a set of guidelines in all of our programs to ensure that we figure out ways in which we can close that gap. Yeah, I think that's so, so important. And like you said, that gap builds and builds and builds and now understanding where it's at. I want to go back to another point that you said, which I think is really, really critical, is SNAP and our other programs are actually cost-saving programs in the long run because of the fact that they keep people healthier. And I think there has been some studies that have shown that for all, for the, I think for WIC, every dollar that gets put in saves, I forgot what it is, but three dollars or something in healthcare costs down the line. And I think more research in this area and more understanding that and more helping the public to understand that would help these programs to be better utilized. Well, I, I think this is a really important point, especially for your students who are here. The ability to calculate the return on investment and to be able to explain to people why an investment of a dollar today saves money in the long run is really important. And the other corollary to this is the level to which SNAP supports jobs. People don't think about this, but uh, I say to my farm friends, you know, you guys get 14, 15 cents of every food dollar. I don't think that's as much as it should be, but for the sake of discussion, you need to understand that if we spend a billion dollars in SNAP, 150 million of it is finding its way into a farmer's pocket. Did you ever think about the SNAP program in that way? No. Well, how about this? How about the fact that, you know, this also helps to support jobs? I mean, if you think about it, if, if, more, if you have more money to spend at the grocery store, what are you gonna do? Well, you're going to spend it. Great. And if you spend it, that means more stuff has to be stocked, more stuff has to be transported, 
more stuff has to be processed, more stuff has to be packaged, more stuff has to be, those are all jobs in the economy. So, you know, you'll find some of the major players in retail are very supportive of SNAP because they understand that in some cases, 20, 25% of their business is dependent on the SNAP, uh, SNAP card. So it's important for us to explain that, uh, the economic and the, the return on investment, so that people understand that it isn't just we're, we're giving something away. The other thing we need to explain is who it is that's getting this. There seems to be this conception, or perception rather, out, of, out in the countryside, that the only people getting SNAP are the people that aren't working and just kind of taking advantage of the system. Well, first of all, 81% of the people on SNAP are either working, uh, adults with children, senior citizens, or people with disabilities. Now, and I say to my friends, well, who are those, which of that group do you want to penalize here? Do you want to penalize those working parents? No. Do you want to penalize the senior citizens that, are, that have worked all their life and are living on a social security check and are having a hard time? No. Do you, you know, the people with disabilities would love to be working, but maybe they can't because of the disability, do you want to penalize them? Well, no. Well, how about those other 19%? Well, those other 19% have a responsibility here. They have to work, or they have to look for work, or they have to get education, and if they don't, their benefits are limited. Yep. Really? No, I didn't know that. Well, y yeah, they're limited. So stop criticizing this program and understand who's helping. And oh, by the way, farmer money, jobs, better health yep. outcomes, kids learning better. All of that's beneficial to all of us. All of it is beneficial, absolutely, to all of us. And thank you, too. You talked about how the, the Thrifty Food Plan was revised. One of the assignments that all of our students do in our community nutrition class is um, to eat for a week on the budget of SNAP, which helps them to understand what the program is and helps them when they're going to be able to work with people in the future. And one of the things that we've talked about is, is that it was low and now that it has been raised, that it actually will help people to be able to afford the healthier foods and to have foods for the full month like you talked about in your speech. Well, we need to continue to improve the, uh, the overall economy so that wages and incomes yes. are improved so we bottom up and middle out. Yes, exactly. We're gonna now turn to some questions from the audience. And the first question that we have from the audience is from Dr. Sarah Aviola, who is currently the Executive Director of the Lori M. Tisch Center for Food Education and Policy here at Teachers College, as well as a research professor. So she's gonna ask her question from here. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Cook. And thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for just a really profound commentary on the importance of the work that's being done by the USDA. How can our center partner with you to help promote and elevate nutrition security? Oh my, They're, well first of all, you're already doing that in terms of the work that you're doing with the students here. Uh, you're instilling in them the importance of nutrition security and making sure that they become advocates as they go into whatever line of work they go into. Uh, I think you can bring uh, the, the, the captains, if you will, of government and food and agriculture to the campus. I think you can encourage them to come. You can create seminars and, and meetings where this issue of, of food security, and nutrition security can be discussed as it relates to their individual business and operation. How are you advancing this? What are you doing in terms of product formulation that makes it uh, better uh, from a nutritional standpoint? What are you doing to support uh, appropriate levels in the SNAP program? Uh, what are you doing uh, to make sure that uh, uh, your workforce may be understanding of WIC, for example. Uh, what are you doing uh, in your local school district? Are you, are, if you're a food company, are you figuring out ways in which you could uh, encourage uh, your, your scientists, your, your chefs, your, whoever's working in your f facility to work collaboratively and in partnership with school nutrition officials to figure out how they can stretch their food dollar, how they can provide uh, quality meals that are delicious even though uh, it, it may be challenging in this day and age. How do you use spices to s substitute for salt? How, you know, how do you create the kind of delicious looking meals that would, that, you know, that would, where, where kids would say, gosh, I'm not trading anything today on my plate, uh, I'm gonna eat it all. So I think convening, you're a convener. I mean, that's why I'm here, right? You've convened me. Uh, it's a beautiful facility here. Convening the captains of industry and, and, and challenging them. All right, and then developing uh, ways in which your students can can 
do internships and, and fellowships, if you will, at their facilities and at USDA. You know, we have uh, a, a keen desire to expand access to bright young minds. Um, and, and we are very keen on embracing diversity uh, in, in those internships and fellowships. And, and, and frankly, uh, it's not because we are, are, are good hearted. It's a we got an aging workforce. I mean, only 8% of our workforce at USDA, only 8% is under the age of 35. And I, I, can tell, I, I don't even want to tell you what the percentage is of people over the age of 50. So the reality is there, there are a lot of folks who are anxious and interested in retiring or thinking about it. We've got to replace those people. We've got to bring new ideas and innovative ideas. And we need to make sure that we, we, we encourage folks to think about the Department of Agriculture. I've been, I've been explaining to our team, look, if you're the Department of Defense or you're the CIA, oh man, you got television shows showing all of that whiz-bang stuff they do. You know, we, we don't have television shows, you know? We should, but we don't. And if, and if USDA is ever mentioned, I mean, I got this job, and now I've had it twice. My kids love me. They didn't think I was anybody until uh, I was on an episode of South Park. And then, I, I mean, I had, I, I had made it, all right? It's about gluten-free, and it was, you know. <laughs> Um, but there's some, there's some truth to this, right? To the extent that you can get the culture to understand the, the amazing nature of the work here. I mean, this, is, this, is, this impacts and affects every single thing. The Department of Defense is worried about nutrition security. Why? Because so few, fewer and fewer and fewer people in this country are physically fit. We're, we're, you know, 1946, Harry Truman said, good Lord, we don't have enough healthy caloric intake people to, to fight in an army, so we gotta feed them. Now the Department of Defense is saying, well, we, we don't have anybody that we can choose from in a volunteer military. So, I mean, that's a national security issue here. It's not just, you know, fun and games here, it's national security. So there's that, there's, there's the whole notion of the workforce of the future and the productivity of the workforce. If you've got a chronic disease, if you've got diabetes, you've got hypertension, you, you know what? I don't care how great you are, it's gonna, you're, you're not gonna be at work every day because there's gonna be a condition that will require you to go to the doctor or whatever. And so it's a productivity issue. So it goes to the economy of the country. So, you know, and then healthcare costs, oh Lord. I mean, you want to talk about sapping, you know, $147 billion a year to treat diabetes today. And Lord knows with the kids' obesity level where it is today, it's, it's estimated that maybe 50% of America will be obese at some point in time. I mean, that's a, how, that's a, that's a very troublesome statistic. $147 billion, the same amount that we spend. So when people say, well, you need to put more money into you know, into this or that, I go, fine. Let's cut how much money we're spending on diabetes because we do it right on the diet side. And then let's transfer those resources into more support for nutrition assistance or whatever. So I think you have an incredible responsibility here to inspire these young people to understand there's real opportunity at, at places like USDA. We need to reach out to your, uh, to this college and say, hey, come join us. Here are the internships, here are the opportunities, here are the possibilities. Come join us, find out how exciting this place is, and then, you know, in some cases, you may want to work here for a while. Thank you, that was, that was great. Um, a couple of, of quick things. One, we're gonna turn to another question in a second that's gonna be about school meals, and, and just a couple of quick things is, when my students were public school children in, in New York City, I happen to have one of our graduates whose name is Ellie Krieger, who's kind of well known because she's written some uh, cookbooks. We were parents at the same time and we were really trying to get the principal to, to focus on wellness. And somehow he read something that was about the increasing rates of type two diabetes. And that gave him pause because he said, you know, we're so focused on test prep and English and math. And of course, those are super important, he said, but if they're gonna get type two diabetes by the time they're 30, we failed them. And I wanna focus on wellness. You, you can incorporate nutrition security into every single one of those other subjects. 
Yes, I mean, we talk, have people in this room that are doing that. All you know, of the food yeah. educators you, in this room. You talk about math, well, half your plate. Well, that's a fraction, right? right? <laughs> and then wh where does the food come from? How is it grown? Well, that's environmental science, right? And is this food imported? Well, that's geography. Right? Yep. And, and climate. I mean, what, what's the impact going to be on whether or not we're going to have, and why do we have uh, these uh, fruits available 12 months out of the year? Well, that's, that's the economy. That's the supply chain. That's the global economy we're involved. I mean, you, you know, there's a history of food that's phenomenal. So you, could, you don't need to have a special class class. You just need to have teachers who understand that they, it's important for them to weave into what they do uh, in, a, in a lesson or a daily some aspect of, of food so it reinforces it. Absolutely. So I'm going to turn to the to the school meals program, and we actually have one of the heads of the school meal program, Stephen O'Brien, in New York City here today. And the question is actually from Monique Lindsay, who is the founder of what's called the Lunch for Learning Parent Caucus here in New York City that's run out of an organization called Community Food Advocates. Unfortunately, Monique is, is uh, caring for a sick friend today and couldn't be here. So we have Natalie Grave-Peters, who is a doctoral student here, who's going to ask her question about school meals. Welcome, Secretary Gilsack. Monique's question. We're happy that school meals have become much better than they ever were. What is not put into the loop is how the children accept the meals. I would like to suggest that every school does a questionnaire about once a month to find out more about how the meals are going for the students asking the students what do they like, what they don't like. Question is for parents too, especially parents of younger children. So my question is, what can we do to continue to improve the school meals, and how can we improve communication with the students and families about school meals? Well, it's a good suggestion on the survey, and I think anybody that, I, I think the question that it has to be asked underscores the challenge we face, which is making sure people understand that the superintendent, the principal, the school board, level the importance of school meals. It's not just feeding the kids, that there is a true educational healthcare component to this that would raise the seriousness of this so that they would understand they need to take this very seriously. They need to incorporate it in, in their thought process as they put a plan together. I think sometimes there is a tendency on the part of some, not everybody, but on the part of some, to look at the nutrition program at the school as, okay, it's gonna cost X, we have Y. Is there any way we can squeeze a little bit out of, out of Y to help some other aspect of the budget kind of thing? And it's because they don't understand the significance and importance of food. We need to elevate this, right? We need to elevate it. So the, I think the first, the first thing is, let me start at the, at, 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 the very, at the very beginning. I think it's really important that we, that we do as good a job as possible in elementary school in terms of improving uh, school meals. Uh, I, I think it's a little harder uh, to incorporate change and so forth after kids get into high, that's not to say we shouldn't do, do it, I'm just saying we need to make sure we do an excellent job at, at, the, at the level of elementary school. Because if you do, then you create essentially small advocates that become yep. big advocates for, for, for quality food. So that's number one. Number two, you know, I think uh, parents have a responsibility here. Uh, you know, a lot of parents reacted adversely when we began the process of putting the school nutrition standards in place. And, and they did because they individualized the conversation. They said, my son's not getting enough to eat because he weighs 235 pounds, he's a linebacker, he needs, you know, 1,200 calories, he doesn't need 835 calories. Well, you gotta remember that the school is basically trying to feed hundreds if not thousands of people at the same time. You know, if you just think about trying to feed a family and get everything on the plate hot and, you know, it's hard, it's very difficult. So, so I think we have to make sure that parents understand that, it, that as, as concerned as they are about their individual child, if they don't think their child's getting fed enough, well then they need to supplement, they need to complement what the school, but they don't need to necessarily suggest that there should be individualized plates because that's just not possible when you're feeding hundreds of kids. And parents need to be 
need to be more engaged and demand of the school districts that they pay attention to this issue. They pay attention to the quality of food. They pay attention to how it's presented. There are examples around the country of schools that are doing a fabulous job. And then there are examples of schools that may not be because they don't place a higher priority on it, right? You know, I think uh, there's no reason why, again, sc schools like this one, you know, vir virtually every, every state's got colleges and universities. There, there are ways in which um, we can do a better job of inviting the, the people who understand the science and chemistry of food into these schools in a consulting and an advisory and a helping you out way, not saying you're doing a bad job, but saying I'm, I'm, I want to help, and doing it in a way that, you know, Denver's got uh, chefs in the school right now, which is a pretty interesting concept. That may be happening here too. Uh, I'm just familiar with the Denver one because I, I recently talked to the guy who's doing it. And, you know, he's in 12 schools. And he says, you know, you, there's amazing things you can do. And these folks are really willing. They want to know how to do a better job. They care about their kids. They care deeply about their kids. So I think there are ways in which we need to be engaged. And then I think the Department of Agriculture, I, we tried to get this through uh, the bill that was called the Build Back Better bill. We had resources designed to, to, uh, to create incentives for schools to go even beyond the standards. Say, you know, you know what, what if you had an extra X? What would you do with it? What innovation would you instill uh, into the program? What, what, what creative thought would you use if you had just a little extra cash? And by doing that, I think we create the, the, the impetus for more investment in these programs. I mean, I was deeply, deeply troubled and very upset that, uh, for whatever reason, uh, the Congress didn't see fit to extend the waivers because these school districts are really, really struggling right now. And they need flexibility, and we need to be helping them. But we've now created a circumstance where, where our challenge at USDA now is knowing that the, there's not going to be a waiver. How do we work around that? And, uh, you know, we're going to look for ways in which we can provide some degree of assistance and help, but it won't be quite the same as a higher reimbursement rate or quite the same as the flexibility that was in the waiver program. Thank you for bringing up the waivers because those were truly very important for schools around the country. And we've been working with different districts around the country that are, are figuring that out. So we appreciate that you're, you're, you're working on that. Dan Giusti, who's the one in Denver, is actually worked in, in New York oh. City schools. And we, we actually were very involved at the Laurie M. Tisch Center for Food Education and Policy in evaluating what he did. And what we showed is that preparing freshly prepared foods in schools can work. It's going to take investment in the infrastructure in the kitchens. It is going to take rallying the school community. It is going to take continuous training of the staff. But one of the things that came from that that was incredibly special is the staff actually got the option to move to another school because it was potentially going to be more work. One person retired early. No one else requested to move. And when you walked into those kitchens, the pride that beamed across everyone was absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, there, there. I mean, I that was in a uh, Kumar. Where was the school with the that I went to, or the uh, food preparation place I went to that had the uh, the, the Chicago? Yeah, was it with the Italian? Uh, yeah. So th this place, uh, mom was uh, a, a, an Italian and she loved cooking and instilled in her daughter. Uh, a love of cooking and great recipes. And so this woman has taken mom's recipes and now is providing 40,000 meals a day. 40,000 meals a day with mom's recipes. And you know, you look at the plate and he goes, well, God, that, you know, that looks really pretty. Give me one of those. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, 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 when you have something like that, you talk about pride, there is a recognition of the importance of it. Yeah. Right. So what we have to do is we have to move beyond uh, it's 20 minutes, we'll rush through, gobble it down, take some time, create an atmosphere where you are saying and, and underscoring the message that nutrition in food is important. It's not just something to get through based on a calendar or right. you know, the school day. It's as important as that math class, as that reading class, whatever. Yes. 
One of, one of the other initiatives that's gone on in New York City schools is a, what's called a cafeteria redesign, which makes a really great choice-based serving line for the students and changes the tables to make a variety of seating conditions. We did an evaluation of that, and this was with 10th graders. Their attitudes towards school lunch went up. And I, you said before, you have to start with the elementary kids. We were so impressed that it went up. It went from 21% of the kids taking lunch up to 41% of the kids taking lunch. And to questions such as, I like school lunch, I want to eat school lunch, those increased significantly as well. So really making school lunch a central part of the school day. One of our doctoral students did a doctoral dissertation on the role that teachers can play. And sometimes teachers had negative experiences themselves. How do we get teachers to fully embrace the program, which will help to make kids want to take and eat lunch? Yeah, I would think every teacher would be interested. I think every coach would be really interested. Yeah. I mean, teachers should be interested because better, better fed, more, more nutrition, better learners, right? Absolutely. We're going to go to our, our third question from the audience, which is going to be asked by Tony Hillary, who is the founder of an organization, Harlem Grown. Uh, thank you, Tish Center and Teachers College, Dr. Cook, and especially you, Mr. Secretary. Um, as the founder of Harlem Grown, that is in the heart of Harlem, we plant fruits and vegetables to grow healthy children in sustainable communities. What role do you see community-based organizations like ours can do to work alongside USDA to promote nutrition security for all? Well, I, I mean, I think you have a critical role, and I, the notion of connecting what's being grown in the neighborhood with the school is, is incredibly important um, for a couple reasons. Uh, number one, we need to do a better job in this country of, of elevating the, uh, I've said this a million times, I'm gonna say it again, elevating the importance of food and understanding where food comes from. Um, and there is a increasing separation between those who grow the food and those who consume the food in terms of understanding each other. And uh, to the extent that we can encourage urban agriculture, which is what you're engaged in, uh, to the extent that we can provide some resources to provide an expansion and an opportunity for growth in that space, I think that's important. And then to encourage, as, as things are being grown, to enable you to have contracts and direct connection with schools and other institutional purchasers in the community creates a farm to fill in the blank, farm to school, farm to restaurant, farm to, inst uh, to hospital, Farm to, to you know to jail. I mean, there there are a multitude of ways in which we create market opportunities that in turn allow you to stay in business and allow you to continue to expand the urban agriculture experience. That in turn, by doing this, there can be linkage between what you do and what the kids can learn. They can actually go to where you're growing their food. They can see the the carrot or the lettuce or whatever it is you're growing. Um, they can they can understand the challenges. The, the disease, the issues that you have to confront uh, growing in a city, uh, the nature of the soil, the science of the soil. I mean, there's a multitude of things they can learn from that experience. They can start their own community garden at, at the school, which you could potentially be helpful with. So look for uh, ways in which the Department of Agriculture in the near future uh, will be announcing some additional assistance and help to expand urban agriculture, to ex uh, expand those opportunities. We've identified 17 cities, uh, and I'm th I think New York's one of them. I, I don't have the list in front of me right now, but that, that, w that, w that are sort of centers for urban agriculture, and we've started there, um, and we're gonna continue to, to uh, provide assistance and help to those communities to expand urban agriculture. But I think, again, you're that trusted voice, right? Yeah, it's not me coming from the government saying, hey, look at this. You're a trusted voice saying, look, I'm helping to grow the food why don't you come on a, a Saturday and, and volunteer for an hour or two so that you learn a little something about what's happening in your community with pride. And why don't you, when you see this lettuce being harvested, why don't you uh, make sure you understand that when you're in the lunch line, you saw that lettuce being grown and you understand how hard it was and you understand the difficulty of tending for this. And, and maybe you'll have a greater appreciation for that food and you should have. So, I mean, there are just a multitude of ways. You can also impact school boards. You can go and talk to school boards about what you're doing, so you educate them about the importance of this circular economy I talked about before, of keeping, uh, keeping the wealth, if you will, in the community. 
I mean, it's one thing for the school district to buy from a distributor that's, you know, located a thousand miles away, and that obviously some of that has to happen, but not all of it has to happen. Right. Some of it can be, can be your, uh, you know, your your farm, and should be. Thank you. You know, um. We talk a lot about urban agriculture, and what I really think is that w what it really does is it, it produces some food, and it can produce some food that can go into schools and become part of the school meal program and supplement what people are eating. In a city like New York, it's never going to feed everyone, and of course, I don't think that's the role. But what it does is it connects people directly to how food is grown, which they are disconnected with. And if we want people to be able to make choices about what we want to grow, how we want to grow it in the future. We need people to see food growing around them, and I think that that's what makes it important. So I really appreciate that you're expanding and supporting urban agriculture. Well, there, there's also uh, an issue of, of just overall food security. I mean, the climate's changing, and it's going to impact and affect where we grow, what we grow, how we grow it. Um, and to the extent that we can, we can have all forms of agriculture, there's a tendency in agriculture, I think, to try to pit uh, thing, uh, folks against each other. And it seems to me that there ought to be a dedicated effort to try to make everybody sustainable uh, and not necessarily to, to suggest that one form or another is necessarily quote unquote better or not, but to, but to facilitate uh, everything from uh, vertical ag agriculture. I mean, there's no reason why some of these buildings couldn't be converted into, uh, into farms. It's a tremendously productive, you know, and the, let's face it, the reality is there are going to be people working in labs someplace that are going to try to replicate the biological uh, process for producing fill-in-the-blank. We shouldn't be discouraging that because the reality is we're, the, the, pop, the world population continues to grow. And, and it's going to be really hard with climate being what it is. And the fact that we lose 2,000 acres of land every single day in this country to development. So, you know... We're putting a lot of pressure on the existing uh, existing uh, capacity of agriculture. We need to make sure that we're, we're, we're not shutting off any other opportunity to supplement what's grown. Yeah. You know, as we're talking about this, it reminded me of a very old article. I think it was a New York Times article from 1914 that was about children growing food in, in New York City and a couple of families deciding to move out of the city because their students, their children, got so interested in agriculture. But I think that that's another role that organizations like Harlem Grown and all the different people in the room here that actually do gardening with children, because our farmer, like you said, USDA is aging. Our farmers are, are aging. We need to get young people really excited about going into farming. Well, the average age of American farmers is close to 60. <laughs> average. Average. Yeah. So we're getting to the end. Um, I want to ask a, a last question, which is we're here at Teachers College, Columbia University, and there's lots of students in person in the audience and a lot actually listening on the live stream, and I'm sure a lot of other students from across the country who are going into careers in nutrition, nutrition education, and public health at this time where we have these high rates of metabolic diseases and, and now this shift to nutrition security. So what messages would you give to people going into this field? Well, first, uh, explore opportunities to get an internship or a fellowship at USDA, because it, <laughs> <laughs> so it may lead to a great career. Um, I, I will tell you, uh, no Secretary of Agriculture has ever been given the opportunity to come back to the department after having served. Uh, so I'm the first one to do it. And people ask, well, why, you know, why did you do it? I did it because I love the people I work with. And the reason I do is because they have an incredible high level of passion for what they do. Uh, and what you want to find is a place where you're working with your coworkers who believe passionately in the work that they're doing uh, and who are willing to work extra hours, willing to make a sacrifice. During the pandemic, it's just incredible the amount of work that was done even though they weren't in quote unquote the office. So I think if you go into an internship or fellowship program, you're going to find a lot of passionate, involved people that will really inspire you. And conversely, I think you can have that same effect on us. Uh, you can bring new ideas, new energy uh, to a system that really needs it. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, understand the significance and importance of the work you're doing. Um, 
it, it, it goes, and I think I've tried to explain this today, it goes far beyond nutrition, far beyond food. It involves national security, it involves the economic well-being of this country. I often say to farm groups, and I'll say it to you, think about this for just a second. The reason you are in this university, the reason you are considering a possible career in nutrition is because some farmer out there has been working 365 days a year to provide you food. You haven't had to do that. It's been pretty convenient for us. All we have to do is go to the grocery store, go to a restaurant, we get fed. That's not always been the case. It certainly wasn't the case when the Department of Agriculture was formed in 1862. 90% of America lived in rural places, and 90% of America had to, had to basically produce the food or they didn't live, they didn't survive. But by having this incredible agriculture that we've had over the course of time, it has freed up the rest of us to do all these great things. It's freed, up, freed me up to be a lawyer. Freed you folks to be an educator. Uh, it freed other folks to be involved in nonprofit organizations. It freed you up to do something else which has created this incredibly dynamic and diverse economy which in turn has created a very strong nation. So the work that you do, way, way beyond food. We got a healthcare crisis in this country, no, no doubt about it. The amount of cost associated with healthcare, astronomical, and we need to make sure we figure out ways to make people healthier to reduce those costs because it will compromise your future. We have a changing climate that is gonna challenge uh, our ability to produce the food. You're gonna be engaged in that, and you're gonna be engaged in that struggle and that battle as well because we're talking about precision nutrition, and we didn't have a chance to talk about that today, but the whole notion of you know, micronutrients and all of how to, how do we target based on who you are, and genetics, you're gonna find out the ability to, to, to personalize. I mean, there's just a whole series of great, exciting things that are gonna happen in this space, and you're gonna be part of it. Now, here's the kicker. We have a partnership with NASA. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. Why would we have a partnership with NASA? Well, we're growing food on spaceships. Why are we doing that? Because, you know, it takes a long time to go to Mars. And we're gonna have people someday in your lifetime, probably, take that trip. They're gonna have to survive. And astronauts right now are working with the Department of Agriculture to, to explore gr the growing of food and the nutrition necessary and needed to be able to maintain their health as they live in that weightless environment for a long period of time. So there isn't anything that, that I can't connect to what you all are studying involved in. So there's an enormous opportunity and, and, and embrace it. Get excited about it, but make sure it, along the way you stop by the USDA. <laughs> That, that is a, a great place to end. I just will say that one of the things that I always have students do when I do education, we'll often go to the farmer's market and buy food, and then I have them write thank yous letters to the farmers that grew their food, and I think that that's a wonderful way of acknowledging that we all get to do what we do each day because farmers have grown our food, so thank you. So we want to really thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for coming to Teachers College today. Your visit is such a timely reminder that equitable and inclusive nutrition security is needed now more than ever. The words that you talked about, everything that you said, and the initiatives that you outlined inspi inspire our community, all of our students, all of the people that are working in schools and communities that are here today doing nutrition education to redouble down on our efforts in supporting evidence-based nutrition education in schools and communities, as well as constantly improving healthful food access especially in low resource communities that have been impacted by inequities. Even though it's spring break, so a lot of our students weren't here, I know that the nutrition students that were here in the audience today, as well as those joining on the live stream, have learned a great deal from you today, and I know I have too. I hope that you always feel like you are welcome to come back to Teachers College anytime. And thank you to our audience, those of you here got, that got to be here in person, as well as all of you watching on the live stream, we are all looking forward to working together to help improve nutrition security for everyone in this country. So now let's give another round of applause to Secretary Vilsack. Thank you.